This is the webinar on Ukraine war and global energy impacts to 2030. Give us a, a minute or so until everyone dials in. You can see the participant numbers climbing now. Just have patience and then we'll get going. This event is being live streamed on YouTube as well for anyone that wants to know about it and a recording will be available on YouTube afterwards. Search for the Climate Bonds Initiative channel. Okay, Mark and Kavita, I think um, we just about got our enough numbers to get going. Okay, we'll get started. Let's then. get going. Okay, thanks, Sean. All right, so good morning, afternoon, or evening, all. Welcome to this joint inevitable policy response, climate bonds initiative, and carbon tracker webinar, which will be focusing on the Ukraine war and global energy impacts to 2030, asking the question how clean energy will outpace fossil fuels this decade. Uh, this session follows the very recent release of an IPR paper on the emerging energy policy response to Ukraine. And I'm Kavita Srinivasan. I'm a senior manager with Vivid Economics, joining you all today from the States. And I'd like to now introduce our panel speakers. Our discussion will kick off with a brief overview of the inevitable policy response with IPR policy director Mark Fulton and an assessment of the impacts of the crisis on global energy policy outlooks and transition scenarios. Welcome, Mark. Hi. Mark will be followed by Bo Lidegaard, co-founder and partner of the Kaya Group, with the latest analysis of the policy response to the invasion. Welcome, Bo, and thanks for joining us. Next, Katerina Hillenbrand von der Nyen, head of research of Carbon Tracker, will outline analysis of what the conflict means for both the global oil and gas sector, as well as power utilities in both the short and longer term. Thank you, Katerina. And lastly, Sean Kidney from Climate Bonds Initiative will give his overview of what it all means for green finance, and in, in particular bond markets and momentum around sustainable investment. Welcome, Sean, thanks for joining. Hey. So we'll follow the Q&A session. We'll take questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A option in Zoom to enter your questions throughout the session and pick them up at the end. And as Sean mentioned, we'll circulate the presentation from today's webinar with a recording link to all registrants after the event. With that, we've got a full session. I'd like to introduce Mark Fulton, Project Director IPR, who will be followed by Bo Lidegaard, co-founder and partner of Kaya. Mark and Bo, you've got the floor for about uh, 10 to 12 minutes or so. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita, and welcome everyone. Um, so if we look at the uh, first slide here, um, essentially, I'd like to explain the inevitable policy response is, is a program that we've been commissioned by the PRI that we've been running for uh, three years. And in it, we forecast uh, what we think policy and technology trends will be, um, as well as and that we, we derive what we call a forecast policy scenario. And that comes at 1.8 degrees uh, outcome. And then on top of that, we also do a required policy uh, scenario that gets us down to 1.5 degrees. So essentially, we've always seen a, a number of drivers of policy. And one of the key drivers we identified years ago was indeed energy security and what we call the new, new geopolitics of energy. This has now obviously received a very large a boost in terms of its importance because of the war in Ukraine. So essentially, uh, we, we are looking at this from the background of our forecasts on the next page. And just to make the point about the drivers, you know, yes, we've got extreme weather, weather, cheaper renewable energy, an uninsurable world, civil society, financial regulation, um, and, and, and influence shifting like the Climate Action 100. But there we have impacts on energy security, impacts on security and the new geopolitics. So I think this fits very much in our view as an accelerator with some short-term disruption, which we'll talk about. So I'm hoping now that Bo has arrived and he will now uh, move on to talking about what, he, what Kaya uh, sees as the developments and then I'll come up with some more specific uh, conclusions for IPR. Do we have Bo? Yes, yes, certainly, very much so. So you want me to dive directly into it now, Mark? Yes, please, you're on. Okay. So um, we, with 
we have been focusing, um, of course, very much on how the situation in Ukraine and what is happening there um, will impact the major trajectories going forward and to which extent the utter disruption will actually change the forecasts. Um, and the overall answer is not fundamentally. Um, the Ukraine um, thing has provoked a fundamental paradigm shift in the sense that whereas the, the climate policy and the energy transition was a nice to have policy ahead of this, it is now a strategic priority, which basically all countries uh, are pursuing. And that implies a different level of political levers in executing the energy transition. So the overarching picture here is one of increasing determination to move from fossil fuel dependency into renewables. That is the long-term trend. In the short term, it's a little bit different. Um, there is an energy crisis looming. Indeed, it's already there, and it can be much worse uh, within hours, days, weeks, or months. And in that situation, there will be a uh, everything of the above. I mean, basically pivoting towards doing everything needed to find energy enough in the system. And that would be a pivot back to coal, back to late night, uh, prolonging nuclear, doing everything, LNG imports, uh, doing everything we can to, to get power on the grid and, and heat houses and keep the industry running. But in the slightly longer term, we believe this will actually uh, strengthen both the renewable um, uh, emphasis and um, uh, demand destruction in terms of energy efficiency. The political package that the EU has been pursuing and still is pursuing, the Fit for 55 package, which is a broad set of policy instruments and incentives, will be uh, maintained. It will be pushed forward. Um, the parts of it uh, relating to uh, energy efficiency and renewables will, um, will, 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 will walk through, whereas some of the issues or the policy measures relating to uh, uh, energy pricing, especially the expansion of the ETS into buildings and transportation, and the very closely linked uh, carbon adjustment mechanism will probably be pushed further ahead. Um, raising energy prices is not possible in the present environment, and these instruments uh, are not likely to, to be furthered in the, um, in the short run. There'll be a lot of efforts to try to cushion the social impact of the high energy prices. Uh, and we'll see um, also major attempts to uh, ramp up financing both for the uh, social cost and for the ramping up of renewables. Alongside that, of course, there's also a, um, a big concern on the European side as to the secondary effects, especially on uh, food security uh, and we'll also see an attempt, uh, uh, I think, from, from basically all countries in the north to, uh, to, um, to um, address these issues while uh, probably not with efficient force to avoid a very serious uh, political disruption following from this. Um, <clears throat> on the LNG side, there will be a very strong push from the US to help Europe, you've seen the commitments uh, to provide additional uh, 15 BCM this year and to ramp up more. Uh, there will be uh, in the US uh, a mix of policy between, um, between drilling more and extracting more, and that is happening. And we also see more uh, financing coming into that. Uh, but we do foresee, despite of that, serious. Um, problems and actually uh, structurally ramping up American LNG exports to Europe with a lack of infrastructure, both on the American and on the European side. 
perhaps a few more words on, on the American side. We are all, of course, as we have been for a long time, carefully watching the BBB process, which of course no longer is called so. Um, there is still, I would say, a chance more than a likelihood that there will be a reconciliation legislation on energy and climate passed this spring. But uh, whereas it was previously more likely than not, it's probably today more unlikely than, um, than likely that it, that it will happen. And we will see in, in the US sort of a dual track, a uh, lot of more extraction, especially on uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, while at the same time, of course, from the administration, uh, still pushing forward and at the state level with a lot of uh, regulatory measures trying to enhance the renewable build out. Uh, for both the US and Europe, very serious considerations um, as for supply chain uh, problems in ramping up uh, renewables at scale. We are talking about a transformational shift in the order of magnitude of renewables ramp up, but that presupposes access to both raw materials and parts uh, largely manufactured in China. And of course, with the Ukrainian conflict, um, uh, risking to, to spill over also into a sanctions regime against China. There are really issues um, there as there are on the broader ESG uh, agenda. Uh, so that is something to, to watch very carefully uh, as we move um, forward. On the uh, Chinese side per se, um, we think it's most likely that China will continue to walk the tightrope that um, it has initiated, being friendly towards Russia, um, publicly adhering to its strategic partnership with Russia, publicly denying to be sort of subjecting itself to the threat of uh, Western American European sanctions. But in reality, um, uh, but in reality, pursuing um, a policy uh, where it's carefully avoiding um, the Western red lines, uh, subjecting uh, it to uh, sanctions. And these red lines, of course, uh, will be the direct military support for the uh, Russian aggression and invasion, or deliberate efforts to circumvent Western sanctions in the financial space, or by ramping up um, imports from uh, Russia to help them out uh, of the uh, squeeze they find themselves in. So we suppose China will continue uh, to be there um, with, a, a, we assume, an increasing wariness not to be actively supporting uh, the Russian warfare uh, and to be seen as being complicit uh, in the invasion. invasion. Uh, the Chinese 2060 commitments looks robust. We think that China will uh, continue uh, its, its uh, policies and regulation uh, to um, achieve it. Uh, actually, in many ways, what the Chinese are doing in putting energy security very high on the agenda and in both building and maintaining more coal capacity than they would probably use in practice, in practice, in the energy system, in the power system, that system of paying a premium for achieving energy security, we believe is a pattern we will also see replicated in, in Western countries um, that are seeking to maintain a, a higher level of energy security and a more strategic level and paying a premium for that, uh, just as it happens in China. That is not to be confused with necessarily using this full capacity, um, um, uh, but we do believe that, that China will uh, continue to build out renewables and continue to rely on, uh, on renewables in the pathway towards fulfilling the that, that 2060 commitments. I think I'll pause here for questions. Thank you. Oh. I think, Bo, we might, we might plow on a bit. So thank you for that. So I'm now going to say exactly what we 
have taken out in the IPR group. So uh, I would say, again, first of all, we should say that it's terrible what's happening and we, we extend our sympathies for, the, for, for all those that are being so terribly affected by this conflict. Um, so there are really three meta developments, or three or four that we talked about. I think in the medium to longer term, we see a reinforcement of the outlook, as Bo said, for renewable energy, green hydrogen, energy efficiency, and so on. So I think that's, uh, that's something that we think energy security is pushing. Shorter term, as we've discussed, the energy crisis for the EU is raised uncertainties. We're going to see more, more coal use probably, and we're going to see some, of course, the sourcing of fossil fuels outside of Russia. This notion of what I call the all of the above approach, which is what Obama used to call it back in, back in the day, um, where you basically overbuild to some extent, as we, as we describe, particularly in terms of the Chinese have, have, have sort of mastered this, that essentially for security reasons, you pay a premium of the cost of your whole system, but you have more fossil fuels in it than you will need eventually, and you run it through capacity utilization. You constrain the capacity utilization of the fossil fuels, but it gives you backup security. So generally, we think that our forecast will remain in place, uh, we'll, at our 1.8, Again, we don't think this accelerates us necessarily faster, but it certainly confirms what we're saying, and it has the potential to accelerate a bit. We do see fossil fuel sector dynamics are going to need reassessing, and Katerina is going to talk about some of those. Um, but generally on the demand side of the world economy, we think that the, the whole green push is still in place. So on the next page, just very quickly to summarize the key sectors, um, essentially we're moving away in the EU from Russia, possible increase in coal short term, nuclear maintained longer, gas storage and LNG being boosted, hydrogen path push accelerated, wind and solar rollout accelerated, heat pump rollout required. Um, and energy efficiency strong focus in the US shale gas, shale focus, LNG exports. But again, we do believe that the administration will push and get through the Congress some of these green energy incentives. And on the demand side, you know, industry will have to think hard about the sourcing of supply, particularly if Europe does end up banning um, Russian gas. And we think the EVs should accelerate faster. Um, again, there are some uh, supply side issues there. And although EU utilities may again burn a bit more coal in the long run, they're going to want to accelerate. So that's our basic conclusion uh, from an IPR perspective. So um, Kavita will stop there. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bo. So Mark, you mentioned, and, and Bo touched upon it, sort of the all of the above approach um, countries are considering as they explore energy security. So focusing both on fossil fuel and low carbon based capacity build. So, so with this all in approach, which will, you know, which will likely be costly, um, can we talk a little bit about the risk of, of this leading to significant carbon lock in for assets, particularly if you look at sort of in the EU, um, both interim and long term climate targets and objectives? First of all, I just mentioned cost. It's, it was interesting to us that the LNG terminals in Germany were actually included under the defense budget push. So you can see security has to be paid for. The question is who pays for it and which part of the budget. Um, so that there is an aspect of, of this, particularly if it's security driven, that can be shared. Um, I think that in terms of lock-in, the key is contracts. And as Bo will say to me, the danger is that to get the LNG terminals into Europe, we will see long-term contracts demanded by the US suppliers. That may cause some lock-in for longer, but generally on coal, that wouldn't be the case. And we think that most people will attempt, as I say, to avoid locking in the fuel supply contracts themselves. They may build the capacity. The question is, do you have to run it? And that's a question of the contracts. And so we're hoping and we expect people to try and manage that um, you know, more carefully. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, 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 I agree uh, entirely. And, and uh, what we see, at least in Europe, is a very strong attempt to use existing infrastructure for the first years to cope with the crisis in order, as Mark said, not to, to lock in long-term investments, 
that is going to be slightly more difficult with the LNG infrastructure. Um, the thing is that in Europe, we have sufficient uh, LNG infrastructure um, to actually service uh, Europe with sufficient amounts of LNG, but it is not located where the need is and we don't have the pipeline systems connecting the parts of Europe, especially Germany, needing the gas with the terminals. So, so there will be some investments there uh, and there will be a premium to pay for, for having these investments. The whole trick here is to avoid that this is going to be a massive pivot towards locking in a new fossil infrastructure. And there, the signals from leading European politicians uh, are that they are painfully aware of this danger. And it's our central case that they will not do that, but there will be an element of it. Bo, oh, can I just, uh, uh, Kavita, could you flick back to the pie chart in the question? Someone's asked if we could, bro, you've only got a minute, but could you just quickly talk about this again? Uh, yes, uh, I can. You see the pie chart? See yeah. Uh, right. The, the, so, the repar so, EU. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this is basically showing um, uh, the alternatives and where alternative energy sources would come from, uh, and uh, and as you can see, the the, the big bulk of it will be um, energy, and 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 a lot of the other things that can be um, used to replace. Um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the gas uh, are actually quite small amounts. Uh, but repiping is also uh, 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 big. And of course, solar and wind uh, front loading, uh, as we know. Okay. And actually, in the chat, we've had plenty of talk about it being an unprovoked, brutal invasion and war, not a conflict. And um, yeah, so we, you know, absolutely, we understand people's uh, uh, strong feelings on this. Okay, over perhaps, to you, and, Katerina. Sorry. Oh, you were going to say? And, uh, well, no, no, yeah, I'll just, oh. I, 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 I'm just going to, to add on to that, to, to, to that. I think it is also, um, as you said briefly, but I think perhaps it's worth emphasizing that as this conflict gets ever more brutal. And as the documentation of war crimes and atrocities uh, are becoming uh, more um, predominant and uh, very much um, uh, 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 creating a, a sense of, of um, complete unacceptability uh, in Europe, the pressure on European politicians to wind down the ongoing energy exports from Russia is growing and it's growing by the day. So it's not only a question of, if only is the right word, of the, con of the war going on and the brutality, but it's also a, a question of the continuation of this situation, which is wearing down the resistance uh, in Europe uh, for cutting off gas. And of course- Okay, Italy, well on that note- Germany, let yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Bo. We'll move I on think to we should Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, Katarina, you actively monitor and analyze developments in in global energy markets. So, what's the carbon tracker view of of energy impacts of this this crisis and war? Yes, I will take you through my slides. Kavita, are they? Can we move forward to my slides, or do I need to? Yes, I can. So, if we could move on straight in. Um, we see it, it's been mentioned already before, but clearly the trilemma has moved to, at least for the moment, to an inverted pyramid with security very much big um, on the top and a redefinition of security. Um, and we're not quite clear what that redefinition might be, and it may well be a contained definition of security with a short-term view and a view to, to winding down the longer-term impact in a second round. Um, we think there is some risk of panic policies uh, within that security context, and it needs to be made sure that those panic policies don't stick and don't divert from the trajectory that we're in. Um, the price premium that is willing to be paid for security, I'm not dwelling in right now, but it has been mentioned. What I would say on this security premium, though, is 
uh, we are thinking it is not going to be universal across the board, but it will be selected because we are hearing the assets or the security has a certain part in the market, but it's not taking over the entire market. So we will see a selected geography, selected areas and selected assets finding a security premium. We don't think that that um, will lead to a wholesale supply curve paradigm shift because, again, the, the assets that may command a security premium may select ones. Um, the big topic is how sticky will some of this will be um, and how much lock-in do we risk seeing? We think it will be limited. Um, but we need to also look at some of the other topics um, in that inverted pyramid. And as it happens with trilemmas, and we've seen it in the past, they do move around in their, their, their current perception of importance. Um, and affordability may well come back. We're already seeing some impact of it. Um, if we look at current energy prices and household impact um, across the spectrum. At the moment, we're seeing short-term fixes, but we would not be surprised at all to, to see affordability actually moving to the top in the next round. Um, and one needs to carefully think what is the short-term cost, what will reverse um, and what will actually not. Um, with regards to climate, um, we see some economic fallout from the overbuild. There will be an overbuild, no doubt about it. Um, there will be some economic impact on the business models. Um, and there will have to be new business models and new regulatory models as to how these assets will make or not a return. Um, but we do think it will avoid, by and large, a longer cliff edge. And we move on to the next, please. If we, yeah, thank you. So um, we've seen a, a whole catalog of, of reactions um, and it's at the moment, it has, uh, there seems to be some misperception of what is actually fixing things right now, what is the medium term, and what are things that are not doing anything for now, but will be longer term uh, measures. And if we start at the longer term, clearly um, announcements about large scale nuclear, um, that's a very long term uh, topic, less mature renewables technologies, maybe a longer term topic. Um, some of the resource build out that is autonomous or local resource, and I'm particularly thinking here about oil and gas, is not going to happen in the next three, neither, neither five or six years, because some of those resources are actually a long cycle. So we're not going to see them until the next decade. So one mustn't mistake some of those announcements as immediate fix. The immediate fixes are really on finding additional contracts somewhere else to the left hand of, of the arrow, um, floating regasification relatively quick, demothballing of coal um, happening pretty much immediately, demand side response to a limited degree. We're seeing some measures in Europe, France and Germany particularly, looking at industrial interruptions pretty much immediately and into next winter. Some of those will get us into next year and fix the, the topic um, over the 12 to 24 months. But then you need to look into the next decade or into the second half of this decade, where you look at shell development, um, other alternative supply structures, some more renewables coming on. Um, some, I've put in small modular reactors here, and I think that's actually quite optimistic to put them around the 2030s. So uh, it may well be, be later, but again, another push to the EV into the to EV adoption. Um, if you divide this into where we are going broadly, we can see an immediate fix next 12 months, the end of that immediate fix impact around the mid of the decade, and then we're moving into longer term territory. But we mustn't forget all of those have an immediate impact, which is obviously a immediate step up um, in costs. We may fix some volume risk very quickly. We will see premium for LNG. There will be flow diversions. And we, in the short term, will have some more fossil fuels in the system. Over the medium term, we're going to be talking about OPEC market share, but possibly also, if we're seeing some shale development, um, a greater likelihood of a more managed case um, of supply coming into the system without a long-term overbuild, because we may see the signals um, through some shale and price containment. Um, and we need to ask, 
whether um, there will be a full wholesale additional cost layer from all the overbuilt, from the capacity security, even if it is contained, and how that will be paid for after all. Now, all of these things will lead to second round impacts. Um, we're going to see a less, less LNG coming into Asia, probably more, more coal burn over there. We're going to see a much more volatile volume and diversion um, market. So volumes will be going moving faster and moving between diff different destinations and probably a sustained price premium, which then leads us to this affordability fallout, which I've mentioned earlier. What we also need to think about when we are um, looking at new contracts, we may be locking them in now, we may be bringing them in, but actually we're locking in a price premium um, over whichever time horizon that is, and it's probably at least the mid of the decade. When we then curtail some of our fossil fuel assets, we're coming towards a new business model and substandard returns for curtailed assets. So overall, it all leads us to a degree of risk of oil and gas stranding, a degree of risk on, on infrastructure and contract stand, stranding, um, probably a limited cliff edge, but overall a new model for the economics of security that has to come to the marketplace. Next slide, please. When we look at emissions going through oil and gas, Again, we're paying a security premium. We're building like there's a likelihood of autonomous resources being built out to a greater degree. Those tend to be higher, higher cost resources, but that means in turn, some of that development may actually require production. So we may see some emissions increase, um, but we would not um, see it as a major cliff edge because as I said before, we think it is select assets that may be built out. Power and utilities, we'll see capacity overbuilt, and that will be on the fossil fuel side. Um, initially, we may see an emissions overhang, and that will later be compensated by curtailment. Um, so again, we're having to think about how will those business models and regulatory models of these assets look like. Um, connected to both of those, we're having um, contract lock-in, um, and we're going to have a fossil fuel volume overhang. So somehow these gas volumes, if you're building the infrastructure, some of that is actually based on throughput. So the, the volumes will be in the marketplace and will they be burnt or not? That will contribute um, to some increase in emissions. But as my previous speakers have, uh, my predecessor speakers have also said, the, the overbuilt is relatively limited and there's a di limited additional investment. So again, we see all of this as contained. Next slide. Um, what we think is very important, and here this is probably my place to say, yes, it is an unprovoked invasion and it is, um, it is brutal and it is something that is absolutely shocking. However, if we now look at what the market is saying to this, it is not different this time to other disruptions. We're having this, a, a major disruption, but it, the, um, when we look at futures and current markets, you're seeing on the left-hand side, if you're slide, um, you're seeing current Brent crude spot markets and the 2023 future. And on the right-hand side, you see how the futures curve, the overall with all maturities has evolved from um, before the, the, the war and after, so before is green and after is, is, is orange. What we can conclude from those, um, we have seen a near-term spot premium over the futures, but that we have seen that in the past and that can contract again. So that would not give us a long-term price signal that we are in a different world. And if we look at the right-hand side of the chart, we can see, yes, the futures curve has shifted up, but as it can shift up, it can also shift down again. So don't forget that. Um, and again, it shows us a steepening of the futures curve. So it's the near term premium that has increased. Um, and when we look at our view of the world, it actually doesn't matter almost in terms of risk of stranding, whether the long term maturity of the futures curve currently is 60 or 75. The risk of stranding of assets there at 60 and the industry needs to look at what is an actual long term demand scenario to figure out their long term oil price for asset sanctioning. So do mind the big message here is 
the industry still needs to mind that investment signal. And the danger is just don't misinterpret that short-term premium. If we could move on. Okay, and maybe just another minute. Uh, Catherine. Yes, and we see this as a as really a short a case in point and illustration of a nonlinear scenario, where we must avoid about a trillion dollars of wasted capital on the wrong price signal, um, short term shale short cycle project and OPEC spare capacity can fill the gap and avoiding long term overbuild. Um, this analysis has been done actually on IPR's first policy response, response scenario where we see an increase in demand to the mid decade and then a sharp reduction in the, in the later stages. Um, if we move on in the interest of time, um, it, we have also looked at some implications on petrostates. Are we going beyond petrostates or be deeper into them? Um, well, we could, uh, one could argue that the security premiums, Russian substitution um, and current price gets us deeper into them. But we firmly see this actually as an acceleration of the energy transition. And the energy autonomy drive doesn't help either because none of that autonomy drive is situated in, in petro states. Next slide, where we will be looking at power and at gas. Perhaps I should skimp over this because in the interest of time, if I've only got one minute left, um, then I will only make the point that it's all about flow diversion. Um, and it will likely lead us into some lower load factors on, on power generation capacity, particularly in Asia. Um, and let's straight go into power and utilities. Um, the big opportunity from power and utilities for us is the lead from, from coal to clean. Um, we have um, done a lot of analysis and a lot of that is, is this, Big, a lot of numbers available on our website and in our reports on how renewables, even with storage within Europe, are already getting cheaper. By the mid-decade, they, decade, they will be cheaper. Um, so that clearly may accelerate even faster right now. But as I said earlier on, if Asia indeed does get starved of gas, we're seeing more coal. We see that as they leapfrog away from gas um, and move straight into clean. Um, and that may actually be the natural course of the marketplace. We've done some analysis on um, uh, what that could do to, to gas volumes. And we actually find that if you, uh, you could save about 40% of import volumes by 2025 um, by simply switching into renewables, uh, because a lot of the, the European gas at least is run, actually run as baseload and that role can be taken on by renewables straight away. The challenge of peak and, and system reliability is a later stage, and this is where your storage proposition comes in and it takes a bit longer. Um, but the existing fleet, the existing power generation park can actually provide that security backstop. And you don't need new build on that. And next, please. We will have new dependencies if we do all of this. It's chiefly metals. Um, and there will be questions such as, what's the premium for? achieving security on that side? Will we be wanting from Russia to other unreliable nations where, where there's concentration? But we would argue there are ways around that. Again, the security premium could possibly translate a manufacturing repatriation um, and innovation solves a lot. We've seen um, a lot of innovation coming through the sector already in the EV case is, is exemplar. How they, you see that on the right here, how cobalt content has actually been reduced and high market price will give you a signal and foster that innovation. Do we think that is something that can be overcome? And in conclusion, on the last slide, we do believe that it is um, a double level accelerator of the energy transition um, because we're seeing volumes coming up, we're seeing sentiment coming up. Um, you see in the uh, clean energy and decarbonized low carbon sources, on the sentiment curve actually currently being behind fossil fuels. Um, but that sentiment, when that shifts, and it will because of we're seeing a, um, a change in autonomy and renewables can provide that, um, you will see positive sentiment, which reinforces capital flows, reinforces deployment, put the policy behind it, and we're moving up fast on the s curves of adoption. So all of that is to say the long term, um, it will be a big accelerator to the energy transition. Thank you, Katerina. We have a few questions. We'll hold them off to the end so we can we can move on. Um, 
to uh, further into investor perspectives and green fi finance with Sean Kidney, CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, Sean, you've been deeply involved on green policy development within the EU. Um, Climate Bonds has, has programs to support green investment. So what's coming back to you from investors? Well, I, um, I particularly am involved in the, the fixed income space, which is the largest capital market. And, and note that in that space, risk is everything. You know, this is a defensive market. You know, Larry Fink once said that um, he was successful at BlackRock by not by ensuring people got yield, but by ensuring they didn't lose their money. Now, what we have here are three rather substantial risk areas that have suddenly come up in front of us. Of course, we've got the first risk, which is fossil fuel autocrat gone mad risk which is not an immaterial risk in the circumstances given the nature of the flow and effect of the global economy, especially when that fossil fuel autocrat gone mad is actually funded by our own economies. When you think about the continual cash transfers the European Union is making to Russia for gas and petrol, and that's going to, get, that's going to become more and more uh, an issue for retail politics as we see more and more horrible stories of massacres coming through. It's going to really drive that home. That's going to put further pressure on change. So this is essentially a risk associated with dependence on, on fossil fuel autocrats with risk of going mad. And there's a few of those around the world. In fact, if you note, OPEC is rather dominated by fossil fuel autocrats. That's one kind of risk. Now, you see that, by the way, playing out in fixed income discussions with what I'm going to call a very robust conversation underway about the relationship between ESG, environmental and social governance, and investment in autocracies, which is going on. I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with everything, but it is, whoa, it is live and hot at the moment. You know, can we count those sort of messages? Do we have to withdraw, et cetera, et cetera? I won't go to the details, of it, but a, from an investor perspective, it's a risk. The second thing that's obviously a big risk is fossil fuel price volatility. I mean, we have been reminded in no uncertain terms about just what volatility can look like. And you've heard some comments about how long the price is going to last, et cetera. Give you an example of where that's having an impact in India, where the current account deficit is blown out by the high cost of gas imports at the moment, which has had a direct impact on the Indian budget because they're subsidising fertiliser generated from gas using the fish and chop process. So the government has a fiscal crisis. You will see some announcements coming through in the next couple of months from, we've already seen some, from major conglomerates in India of what can only be called unbelievably massive investments in renewables to generate green hydrogen, to generate ammonia for fertiliser substitution, which will save the government's bacon. Uh, and, th and that's going to be a pressure on demand economies, on economies that are taking in fossil fuels around the world to try and fix the holes in their budgets and their current account deficits that are appearing to result. And it's the demand side that changes things, not the supply side going forward. And this is at a time when renewables are at extraordinary low cost historically. We now have that, that price crossover in many markets, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels now. Once you address the capital cost, and what do we have in Europe in the US, we have a surfeit of capital at relative, still relatively low capital cost. Now, inching up slightly, but it's tiny. So if we can transfer the low capital cost available in Japan, Europe, and the US to those countries exposed, you're get, and, and you're going to see some announcements coming through in the next six months about this, you're going to see a whoosh take up of low cost renewables with the benefits that these are reliable and predictable. They are predictable. And I remember the biggest threat basically big tech investors is volatility. Predictability is gold dust. By the way, that's also the case in fertilizer where we have a major fertilizer crisis in Europe now because our inputs for our fossil fuel generated fertilizer rely on inputs from Russia. So we're looking for alternatives now. Same issue as India in a way. Think about that as energy security, but I'm just gonna say, Volatility, we've, you know, we've got a classic lesson and how volatility can freak the world out and it's not going to stop quickly. But the third one, which is quite important in the context of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out today, very important report that says that unless we cut emissions 50% by 2030, we are toast. 
essentially, we have catastrophic climate change, is the abrupt change risk. And one of the things that we have that for absolute certainty amongst the investors now is the future will be clean and green. There's just a big debate about how long it's going to take. Is it going to be 10 years or 50 years? You know, most people are taking big cautious and saying, oh, a longer run, it's going to take a while. But what this is teaching is actually some of these changes can happen quite quickly. And, you know, hey, maybe the risk, which is now a more substantial risk that which countries will meet their 2030 targets or announce the Biden climate summit last year, maybe that actually is less of a risk than we thought. In other words, they might actually achieve it because of these step changes that are shown by the, the, the war that's happening at the moment. So going forward, we're clearly going to see a reshuffling of energy investments. Yes, there will be a spike in fossil fuels, I think. Coal in Poland, I'm on record as saying, keep the coal plants open and don't build new gas because coal is dirty. It's going to go. We will, we will, but if we build gas, we're creating 25-year assets, new fossil fuel assets, and the reduction in greenhouse gases from shifting to LNG is actually not as nowhere near as substantial as the energy being painting. So it's not actually that much of a benefit. And I think that's what we'll see happening in Europe. Yes, you'll see a short-term step up in coal. You will see a replacement, a substitution of gas from other markets to replace Russian gas, but it won't be enough, unfortunately. But nevertheless, you'll see that. I don't expect the overall gas to go up. I think it'll still go down. The only question is whether the horrific news we continue to get from Ukraine will drive a, a voter reaction to our continual, still underway as of today, dependence on Russian gas and the forking out of money there, which will then lead to a faster transition. We will see a rapid, vast capital push into energy efficiency in places like Eastern Europe, where the winds are very, very easy to get. By the way, that has the benefit of job creation, quite useful at the moment. We will see a growth of grid investments because interconnectors have been one of the big sticking points in Europe to connect up markets where there are renewables, like just like Northern Germany and Southern Germany. And of course, benefited by low, relatively low capital cost in Europe. Essentially, it's a pushing through of the planning blocks that have stopped this happening. And of course, in some cases, countries getting in the way, like France slowing down some of the uh, interconnectors and so on. Um, we will see an amazing flourish of renewable energy innovation. Suddenly, there'll be contracts galore. Just give you one example. I've got a friend who's invested in a solar cell printing plant, and they're about to go large scale rollout. This is printing solar cells in, a, in one location that they can send out their cells like wallpaper. The efficiency of the cells is the same as current technology in fixed plants, but the cost is way, way lower. And more to the point, the flexibility and speed is in, uh, an order change different. Suddenly, their, their forecasts have gone through the roof and they're talking about a plant being built in Europe to roll out renewables. Now, you'll get all sorts of things coming through that have been hanging around, not coming through fast enough, but especially in Europe and Japan and the US because security in relation to autocrats is now dominant in people's minds. There's a desperate need, certainly in places like India, to not be reliant on suppliers in China, for example, going forward. So you're gonna see a lot of innovation in that area and then finally, I'm going to say, you're going to see the preparation for the change. I mean, there's a, there is, I've been pushing the European Commission to push, put out social bonds to fund refugee support. But also, there is a discussion underway to start preparing for the war being over. We have to be confident it's going to be over. You're going to see a really strong focus on green building back, on green bonds in Europe to support Ukrainian rebuilding. And that's going to be part of, I'm going to call it the narrative switch. Now, it looks like a gas fill-up, but actually the real winner of all of this is the lunacy of being dependent on volatile fossil fuels owned by autocrats. That's actually the message that's come out of this. And the alternative is reliable, breathable, now low-cost renewables. So everything says that is going to boom. It's just going to go up and down. In a couple of years' time, you're going to turn around and say, whoa, that was fast. Thank you, Sean. I think we'll now move to some of the questions we're seeing in the chat and come Avita, back. Avita, could I, 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 yeah. I, something I didn't do, I, 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 a bit of miss. Uh, 
we don't talk about land use very much. Um, and that is very important. We do a lot of work on land use, although Sean has mentioned fertilizers. So I don't know if it's possible to flick back to my slide, but simply put, I think the number one thing that uh, one of our um, contributors who's in the chat, Tanya Coatsen, has, has pointed out is that if you really want to reduce um, the whole problems with wheat and, and fertilizer and so on, peak meat is a very important idea. So we in, the, in our forecasts expect plant-based meat and, and new technologies to make a big impact on the food supply market. And that would reduce the dependence on cereals and associated fertilizers. So that's something I think people really need to think about. It's not just going on in energy markets. There's quite a lot of disruption in the land use markets. And um, you know we've got 30% of cereal exports, global cereal exports coming out of Ukraine and Russia. So there's going to be disruption. We need to get onto it in the short run. And in the longer run, we believe that this notion of peak meat could be very helpful. So that's just an idea I wanted to uh, wanted to get out there. Sorry, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's important. So if we move on to the Q and A, um, I'll, I think we have time for about two or three questions. Um, I think one we got in is, um, uh, I think maybe we'll give this one to Bo first and then go around. Um, the question is, what are the risks that policies meant to result fossil fuel related energy prices in the short run subsidies? for example, um, could be politically difficult to reverse um, and then could have impacts on sort of the, the pace of the energy transition. But we'll start with you on that one. You're on mute, Bo. As, as the question suggests, it is politically very hard uh, once you have um, initiated the idea of fossil fuel subsidies for the, at the consumer level to get off it again. And I think politicians are aware of this danger. And there are, of course, ways of helping the most exposed segments of population to, to um, alleviate the pain of the very high energy prices without making it directly subsidizing the fossil fuel. And I think the schemes that the EU um, are considering are exactly the kind of schemes that does not directly subsidize fossil fuel. But the underlying dilemma, of course, is that as several of the interventions have been suggesting, we may well be in for a long period with high energy costs. And if that is the case, uh, this would be a big draw and also a little bit distorting the market signal. So there is a, a, a dilemma, but I don't think the European politicians will fall into the trap of directly subsidizing fossil fuel. Thank you, Bo. Uh, another question we have, we might send this one to Katerina. Um, the question is on um, costs and, and, and tight gas markets. So what can be done to incentivize natural, natural gas production globally if producers are con concerned about the, the terminal value risk of assets? I may start with you. Right, so the question is, how could we get people to produce more natural gas? I understand that, right? Correct. Right, well, it's sort of, in a way we, um, we, uh, we actually don't want them to produce more natural gas over the long run. We want to have that 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 marginal amount of that marginal BCM, which allows for the security of the existing fleet to operate on curtailed or emergency load factors. And obviously, then we have other sectors such as heating um, and other areas where it takes longer to decarbonize. Um, but where is the uh, you know, where are we getting into, you've got two ways of incentivizing. I mean, it, it goes through pricing and that pricing um, comes in. However, uh, and we're seeing that right now. However, the, the topic is probably, are we having short, can we get to a world where we have some sort of short term and marginal BCM that is incentivized, whereas similar to analogous to oil, where you don't have a long cycle over investment into the wrong assets um and the problem is with uh, you know if you look into that the short short term flows are lng but the required investment for that is a very long term one then you might get into very severe overcapacity situations a decade down the line so the, i know this doesn't fully answer the question but uh, um 
you know the what is the the own the what if you wanted to i just feel um that we need to look at a different framing to this question because if we're just saying um you want to invest um incentivize production of the commodity well then you need to see that you need to see some sort of a you need to see the pricing signal but that will in turn mean that the commodity is going to be here and will get produced and then we get the fossil fuel overhang um so I, I would suspect it is about selected assets it is um and that's not achieved through that massive lng premium and ultimately it has to go to substitution through hydrogen or other means and probably hydrogen is probably the answer thanks katarina a final question to sean Kalita, could you just take the slide down for a minute okay. um, because yeah people prefer to Final question to Sean. So the question here is, uh, couldn't we, couldn't we, isn't there a risk of seeing a new generation of autocrats emerge in the metal space? Um, mentioning Chile, Congo, China, exposure to big five tran energy transition minerals. Um, and is, you know, our alternative technologies such as iron ore batteries, the solution? There's always a risk, but that's the whole point of the current crisis. It's driven home a risk that we've been ignoring for a while. And that's going to colour investment going forward. But also on the mineral side, there's a lot more diversification available to us at the moment. And note that the improvement of, of material usage is happening very fast. Tesla uh, batteries used to be 30% lithium about, uh, when they started, and now they're 5% lithium already. So the reduction in usage of existing um, materials, at least per car, is happening quite dramatically. And there are new technologies coming through. As this industry grows, we will look back in 10 years' time and we will be shocked at the technologies that we used to use versus what we're using. And there's a whole bunch of patents for glass-based batteries, for example, that were filed at the University of Austin three years ago, which are now moving into production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a risk, although I must say in the chat, your, your comments about Chile being uh, an autocracy risk, I don't think there's much chance of that in the near future. But yeah, Congo, of course, there's a risk there. China, and that's one of the things that we in democracies have to do, is we have to work very hard to minimize that risk of drift to autocracies, which is not something we have done in the past. Now, we'll have a discussion separately about whether that's going to happen or not. But I want to just add one thing related to another comment, which is can Norway help with natural gas? Is Cyprus and Greece going to work? The key point about all of this, there is going to be intense demand for gas in the short term. You're going to make hay while the sun shines for the next six years or so, everyone. It's getting fantastic if you're a gas producer. But if you're bringing on new fields that got a 30-year ROI, you've got a problem because the, the trajectory of change for renewables is going to be boosted enormously now. And so if you're looking 10 years out with the reduction in price that's getting, with the new announcements of, of, net, of uh, renewables around the world and, and green hydrogen, basically I'm going to say in 10 years' time, gas is going to be toast in terms of forward projections. So... If you know, stay in it, hang on to your shares for six or seven years. If you're an existing producer and you can rank up production like Qatar or Norway, go for it. But if you're relying on a 30-year investment, making money back, and that's the problem with the new fields of Cyprus. Thank you, Sean. With that, I think we'll need to wrap up. So many thanks to the audience. Answer, could I just say also thank you to everyone for your comments in the chat. I've been um, trying to throw in some answers. Lots of people have as well. So uh, thank you very much for those, those comments and, and observations. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and we'll be circulating a link both to the, the slides and also the paper that was just released on the IPR website. Um, so I wanted to thank our panelists once again, Mark Fulton, Project Director of IPR, Bo Lidegaard, co-founder and partner of Kaya Group, Katrina, Thank you very much. And Sean Kidney, thank you. And a very special thank you to Climate Bonds Initiatives for generously hosting this event. Um, we'll put all the, the, the links on the website and circulate that link. So thank you very much to all.